So first of all, welcome to this meeting of the Berkshire Ornithological Club. Back in 1947, the Reading Ornithological Club was formed. It was uh, mostly interested in the birds in the Reading area, but including parts of Oxfordshire. Um, over time, we changed our name to the Berkshire Ornithological Club to reflect the area that we were interested in. And tonight we're going to be looking at um, the contribution that this club has made to knowledge of birds in Berkshire and to the changes in the bird life over those years. So I'm going to be brief. We've got some brief announcements to make first of all before we get on to the main business of the evening. So <clears throat> First of all, I have to mention there's a photographic competition coming up very soon. It's going to be on the 16th of March, but the deadline is Friday the 4th of March. Um, there are three categories, so as usual there's portrait and flight and action, but we've got a different category this year, which is attention to detail. So you can make of that, make what you want of that. Um, and also to mention that um, it's open to University of Reading Bird Society members as well. Um, next, um, some sad news to, to report to you the loss of Peter Spillett. He's been the leading light of the Reading RSPB group for many years. Um, I, I have more details if you want um, one more detail, then please speak to me. Next meetings. Um, in a fortnight's time, there's a talk on Oxmoor, a wetland rediscovered. We've got two outdoor meetings coming up very soon. Tomorrow at Wishmore, so speak to me if you're interested in that. And then on Sunday the 20th of February, Stanford Marsh. But in, in all cases, contact the leader before you, um, uh, if you, if you're interested in going on one of these excursions. <coughs> And finally, we have made for us some really nice uh, bird boxes. So, so um, my assistant Sue is going to model, <laughs> model it in front Your of the camera. Assistant, sure. <laughs> it's really heavy, very substantial. Oh, yes, carefully yeah. on to So these are really good quality bird boxes. They've been made by one of our members, Richard Sajak. Um, they, they open up at the front so they can be cleaned out and very, <laughs> very substantial. Um, as they're good quality boxes, we're, we're looking for a you know a reasonable donation um, for the neighbor of club funds. Richard isn't uh, taking anything for them, so it's, it's neighbor club funds um, in, in the order of 20 pounds or so. Let's have a look at so. yeah, this one is the favourite one now, and there will be five more by next Monday or Tuesday, and another five by the following week. If anybody wants to order one or tell me about it, and I will arrange it. So either deliver it to you or whatever. Okay. Sure. Thank you. So let's move on to recent sightings. Um, what have people been seeing? Robin. Uh, so, um, week before last, I saw uh, Richard Pippet just down in North Hampshire um, in the, um, the, the Wildmore area of uh, uh, Hampshire rather than our Wildmore. Okay, so. Uh, it's that's really it. interesting because it's got not a tail. It's, um, it's just Richard Pippet as well. It's a um, lot of tails on it. So, um, Robin Dryden, he's reporting a, a Richard Pippet in North Hampshire. Um, just just to be um, east of the A33 as you head towards the basic state. Just east of the A33 and to help by identification, it's it's missing a tail. <laughs> Trevor? No, sorry. Um, the, all I'm aware of, um, 18 white fronted geese in the Lee, Lee Farm area. They've been around for some time. Um, also two at Padworth Lane and the pink footed geese is still around there. Lots of repressive orchard in the Hose Hill and Burfield areas. There's been another report of a lesser spotted woodpecker. So this is the time of year to 
look out for them while, while the, the trees don't have any leaves on. Um, there was an interesting report of Hawfinch at Southcote the other day. <clears throat> and the first summer visitors are in, um, had oyster catchers in a few places. Okay, so let's move on. Um, so what's going to happen now is that we're going to hear three, three talks from um, members or past members of the club. <clears throat> there, there probably won't be an interval, but if you, the audience at home wants to put the kettle on, I, I suggest after Neil's talk, so approaching nine o'clock, um, as we switch over the technology, you'll have a, a quick opportunity then. And then after the final talk, um, those who've turned up at the uh, lecture hall with the prospect of cake, um, <laughs> they'll be um, looking at the memorabilia on, at the front here, um, enjoying the cake. I'm sure the online audience won't be interested in that. So we'll switch you off and we'll come in here. So now, um, it's time to introduce the first talk. So Andy Swash, he's had a very varied career as an environmental advisor, and he's now managing director and senior editor of Wild Guides, which is a wildlife publishing or, um, company. He's been the club chairman and president, and he's given lots of talks to the club in the past. And I remember him describing trips to see incredible species, and then incredibly he's actually seen them. And I remember the birds like Black Eared Miner and Key West Quail Duff featuring these tools. Um, unfortunately, due to family concerns and work pressures, he, he's not able to be with us tonight. But we have Neil, and he's going to read a personal message from Andrew. Right, good evening, everybody. Um, this is a personal message from, from Andy. He's asked me to read. He says, I'm very sorry that I'm not able to join you in person this evening to mark the remarkable milestone of 50 years of the existence of the Reading Ornithological Club, now, of course, the Berkshire Ornithological Club. But unfortunately, personal circumstances have contrived to thwart my best intentions. I'm therefore extremely grateful to Neil for kindly agreeing to read out this note in which I've tried to recall some of my fond memories of birding in Berkshire back in the 1980s and 1990s, and to consider the important role the club has played both to me and to the birds of the county during this time, which role continues to this day. I first moved to the Reading area in 1983 and worked for a good few years as a biologist at the Ministry of Agriculture offices at Coley Park. It was here and during regular excursions to many of the excellent bird locations nearby and elsewhere in Berkshire, that I first met many of the stalwarts of the Reading Ornithological Club and the Newbury District Ornithological Club, and it didn't take long before I, for my wife Jill, joined the clubs. The regular fortnightly evening meetings of the ROC, held from October to March in the Palmer Building at, in Reading University campus, were certainly the highlight of our social calendar. And whatever the subject, the talks by eminent speakers from near and far were always a source of great inspiration. Jill and I were given a very warm welcome to the club and over the years got to know many of the members and made some great friends with whom we maintain regular contact to this day. I often think back to some of the fantastic talks I was pri privileged to listen to all those years ago, sitting amongst the serried ranks of like-minded people in room 109. And of course, at those memorable events, such as this evening, that were held to celebrate notable milestones for the club. A few of the talks that spring immediately to mind include one by the great luminary Geoffrey Boswell at the 40th anniversary dinner in 1987, those by John Lawton and Jeremy Greenwood at the 50th anniversary dinner in 1997, with a memorable response from none other than Donald Watson, the wonderfully illustrated and enthusiastic talks by another of the club's past presidents, the late, great Gordon Langsbury, who succeeded me in 1999 after a short tenure as president when I had to move away from the area for work. 
and the, at the time, innovative event featuring the acclaimed bird artist Ian Lewington painting live on stage with an image of his artwork projected on the screen. There were many uh, wonderful evenings, and I could go on for ages, but these are just a few of the examples that had a particular effect on me. But there was another regular event in the club's calendar at the time that I would especially like to mention. That was the one I always looked forward to. Those special and fascinating evenings with the president, the esteemed wildlife artist Robert Gilmore. Robert, unfortunately, is also unable to join this evening's event in person, but I'd like to take a moment to reflect on his particular contribution to the club. This has been more than 70 years since he joined as the first ever junior member at the age of 13, and continues to this day with his unfailing support in generously contributing his wonderful artwork for the covers of the annual reports, the first of which he produced in 1950. A remarkable commitment by a remarkable man. I have to admit to being somewhat daunted, but greatly honoured to be asked to succeed Roberts as president when he moved to live in Clyde in 1998. He'd done so much for the club and was certainly a very hard act to follow. Dear, dear. I can't remember exactly when it was, but fairly soon after joining the club, I was asked when I'd be prepared to speak at one of the evening meetings. At the time, I remember feeling somewhat overawed at the suggestion and wondered how it could possibly contribute something others might find of interest. Having listened intently to many fascinating thoughts by excellent and passionate speakers of travels to often far flung places in search of birds, I felt I might have something to offer in this department. And so it was that I gave my first talk. This may have been about the deer, but I'm afraid I can't quite remember. If anybody does remember, by the way, please let us know. Uh, illustrated with a series of slides from my own travels. Thankfully, this seemed to go pretty well. And over the years that followed, I was pleased to be able to contribute regular talks about the trials and tribulations and, of course, joys of travelling to some of the places I'd been fortunate to visit, interspersed with the occasional talk on rather more relevant local topics, such as wager and travel identification. I think the key point about these talks, whoever presented them, is that they were always a source of great fascination and often inspiration, and also provided an opportunity to meet up with friends on a regular basis to share the information about birds and to foster ideas. I seem to remember that it was one of the social gatherings down the pub after one of the evening talks, the suggestion of coordinating a breeding bird survey of the county was first mooted. And as the rest, as you'll hear, is, is, is history. Actually, I'm not saying that's right, but never mind. The field meetings and conservation initiatives organized by the scholars of the club are, of course, other key activities that are made tangible difference to members enjoying the birds, and safeguarding key habitats in the county and assuring the future of many of its important bird populations. Time inevitably moves on, and notwithstanding the unprecedented situation we've all found ourselves in over the past couple of years, the advent of the internet and instant communication has undoubtedly resulted in a significant change in people's way of, way of life, including the imperative to attend meetings here and learn more about bird related subjects and find out the latest news. This probably explains the gradual decline of the number of people attending these meetings, a situation that's not unique to the BOC. That said, the advent of virtual meetings, thanks to Zoom, as of today's event, has meant almost anybody can still attend and enjoy the meetings from the comfort of their own home. The importance of ornithological societies of which the BOC is a shining example, should not be underestimated. By encouraging an increased awareness of birds and environmental issues at the local level, coordinating activities that provide a means of monitoring the distribution and population of birds and undertaking vital conservation work, the club has a key role to play in helping assure their future. It was over 20 years ago now that Jill and I moved away from the area to live in Devon. But the halcyon days of birding in Berkshire, where we made so many friends, helping to coordinate the first breeding atlas for the county, and enjoying those wonderful evenings in Room 109, being entertained by so many great speakers, and the opportunity to contribute in some small way to club activities, will long last in my, the last long in my memory. I would really have loved to have been able to join you this evening to help celebrate 25 years of the existence of this wonderful club, but regrettably it was not to be. 
I would very like to send my sincere thanks to Renton Rigoletto, our current president, president and Neil Butler for their, their, for their input to this event, and for doing so much to move the club forward, as well as making such, such significant contributions to conservation and monitoring initiatives in the county over the years. I'd also like to wish everybody associated with the club all the very best for the future, and most importantly, good birdie. And good birdie. Right. Well, thank, thank you, Neil, for reading that out. And if, uh, if Andy does hear this, thank you very much for your message to us tonight. It's uh, certainly brought back uh, lots of good memories. So, well, it's me again. It's, now it's Neil. He's going to give a talk of his own. It's me again. My talk this evening is entitled The Birds of Barcher. Mapping and writing up the county's birds. Yeah, okay, thanks, thanks, Rob. <laughs> Let me just first of all give you an outline of what I'm going to be discussing. Right, it's going to be based around the two editions of the Birds of Parkship, which incorporated bird atlas surveys. I'm going to be looking at why atlases. I'm going to be giving you, uh, putting it in context of avifaunas and report surveys, I'm going to give a brief history of atlases, and then I'm going to take you through the story of the two editions of the Birds of Parcher and their associated bird atlas surveys. But I'm not going to do it as a simple narrative story. Instead, I'll be showing you how the various elements in their production show how things have changed over the life of the club. In a similar fun, um, fashion to that Radio 4 series, of a few years ago, the history of the world in a hundred objects. Here will be the history of local bird recording and monitoring in two books. Ornithology, the science of the study of birds, that's what we're all about. As knowledge has grown, we've become increasingly aware that bird populations change over time. The recording of what we see has always attracted people, but as interest has grown, so is the, the appreciation that this recording needs to be carried out in a more structured way to properly monitor these changes. Birds have done well in terms of the gathering of information. They're easier to see than other animal life, and this creates a virtuous circle. More people look for them, so more records can be gathered, which in turn makes the monitoring of bird populations easier. There is a, there is a substantial number of observers Citizen scientists, scientists we now call ourselves, who really give time to observation and sharing their observation with others. Robert Gilmore always used to make the point at the end of our AGMs that the legacy that the club left was the records that it accumulated over the years. There is a problem though. We tend to recall the unusual or what we consider interesting and visit the places we like to go birding where we know such birds will be found. Experience has shown that without any structure, there are a lot of birds that sadly have flown under the radar, which have declined substantially, almost or actually disappeared without hardly anybody noticing until it's too late. Examples, Rhinet, Redback Shrine, Grey Partridge, Lesser Spotted Woodpecker, Corncrake, Tree Sparrow, House Sparrow, Starling, Turtle Dove, Spotted Flycatcher, Cuckoo, Linnet, Redpole, Hawfinch, Yellowhammer, Corn Bunting. All too often there has been a realisation, oh we don't see as many of those as we used to, or we don't get them anymore. In recent decades, national monitoring schemes have now helped monitor these declines, but often when species get to the point where statistically significant results cannot be generated, because there are too few of them around, and their situation becomes critical, they fall outside the, the remit of most of these. Atlases help to fill the gap. So here is, by way of background, a quick history of life of four atlases. Right. Back in the 19th century, much of what was published was simply information gathered by bird watchers by correspondence with others that they knew often backed by, by visits to taxidermists, or as they were often called, bird stuffers, 
<laughs> These could be a little unreliable if the trader in question was less than honest, or his suppliers were, in the information they gave about the provenance of their stock. This is reflected in the two earliest readily available accounts of Bartle's birds, shown here um, on the left and the centre. Clark Kennedy's pioneering 1868 birds of Berkshire and Buckinghamshire, and Heatley Noble's account of the counted birds in the Victoria County History of Berkshire, published in 1906. You can read Clark Kennedy online, in fact, that, that um, web address up there, and hopefully this talk will be available online in case you haven't noted it down. Uh, that, that's an American organization that scanned it and has put it up on the internet. Google it if you can't, from, can't find that. You'll find much of the information comes from a very small number of friends and correspondents. Things began to change in the 20th century. First of all, in move forward, 1907, the establishment of the then commercial journal, British Birds, provided a means of organising surveys on a national scale. For example, for a time it ran the National Women's Scheme. One of its surveys, the Heavenly Survey of 1928, developed into the first national annual survey. In 1933, the BTO was set up. And then in 1947, Sir Peter Scott's newly established Wildfowl Trust began the annual wildfowl accounts. On a local scale, local bird clubs began to appear after the First World War. Our neighbours up in Oxfordshire, the Oxford Ornithological Society, being founded in 1921. These local societies began publishing reports summarising records in their area. Initially, the OOS started off by covering Berkshire, Buckinghamshire and Oxfordshire together. Inevitably though, based on casual re recording, these for all their value do suffer from recorder bias. They, record, they are a record of what we see, where we go birding or what thinks in their submission as an interesting or noteworthy record. Even though over the years, re recorders have continued to plead for more records of under-recorded species. Nonetheless, this more organised basis of generating bird records did mean in the 20th century some more comprehensive counting local avifaunas could be produced. A local example being Mary Radford's Birds of Archer in Oxfordshire, going back a slide on the right there, which was published in 1966. So this really is where we came in. This was the world of bird recording and publishing at a local level in 1947. The ROC, as it was then, started publishing an annual report on the birds around Reading. After 1974, this became the annual county report, which remains a core part of the plant's activity. The BTO has taken the lead in developing monitoring surveys. Initially, most of these were short-term studies of single species or groups of species. But in the late 1950s and early 1960s, concern was growing at the impact of agricultural change. And in particular, the issue of chemical pesticides and their effect on wild bird populations. To address this, the Common Bird Census was launched. While it was very useful in providing a national benchmark for bird populations, it was time consuming for the participants, with eight to 10 visits required each spring, mapping all birds encountered in the survey area, which is typically an area of about 150 acres of farmland, and then transcribing the records into species maps for each species encountered. It, it attracted between two and 300 participants a year, inevitably quite a bias towards the more populated areas of southern England. Between 1994 and 2000, it was gradually replaced by the Breeding Bird Survey, BDS involving just two visits a year to randomly assigned one kilometre squares, resulting in a considerable increase in take-up. There are now over 3,000 participants. These, though, produce a great fund of data for assessing with considerable accuracy national population trends of our common breeding birds. They do not help much in informing us as to what is happening on a local scale to our bird life. The third means of monitoring wildlife is to map distribution. In the, the Botanical Society of British Isles, it's shown the way 
with its Atlas of British Flora, published as long ago as 1962. This was based on fieldwork started in 1954. The VTO launched its breeding bird atlas in the late 1960s. Fieldwork ran from 1967 to 1972. Initially, there was skepticism that national coverage could be achieved at the scale of mapping, which is based on 10 kilometers squared of the national grid. So that's 100 square kilometers in each recording area. But it was. All, all squares were, were, were covered, and indeed it stimulated interest amongst birders. All three national atlas projects have resulted in a notable increase in BTO membership. We like them. The first breeding atlas, cover of which is shown on the left again, Club Connection, note the Robert Gilmore cover. I must have space stations so that <laughs> was, um, was, was published in 1977. It was followed by a, a winter atlas for which the field work based around time counts was undertaken in the early 1980s. That's in the center again with another Robert Gilmore cover. And the second reading atlas was undertaken between 1988 and 1991. The one there on the right, which also involved time counts but in a sample of tech pads, that's Two, two kilometers by two kilometers squares based on the national grid. So some idea of abundance could also be gained. The fieldwork for the first national breeding atlas stimulated a first wave of local atmospheres. Indeed, the very first, that for the West Midlands, the far left there, was, appeared as early as 1970. The other three, London, Bedfordshire and Hertfordshire, not a coincidence that the second and third of those were included, counties that included the headquarters as it was then of BTO and of the RSP, were carried out at a much finer scale of detail. Tetrads, two kilometer by two kilometer squares rather than 10 kilometer squares, which has become the standard approach for local and county atlases since. These were undertaken at the time of the fieldwork of the first national atlas in the late 1960s and early 1970s. Bearing in mind that this is before the era of personal com computing, the scale of the parks must have been considerable. The first, atlas, the first London Atlas, though, appeared as early as 1977, just a year after the National Atlas. Bedfordshire and Hertfordshire following in 1979 and 1982, respectively. So the big challenge was this. This is a this is a quote from a, from a history of the uh, botanical atlases, summarizing how you enter data in the late 90 or the late 1950s and early 1960s. Well, you have to um, put them all on record, all on record cards, summarize these into a single master card. These are then in, input data into a 40 col column punch card, one card per record using an automatic key punch. So on and so on and so on. There's quite a palaver to go there. And indeed, this is a little bit where I come in because I'm just about old enough to remember punch tape and punch card for computers. And of course, in those days, I mean, our school computer was a room. When I went up to university, <laughs> each department had a computer and it was a building that you had to book time in. So it, it was really, uh, London in particular, I think we're very lucky to have a, 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 a very organized accountant, David Monte, putting everything together to enable them to succeed but things were changing. Technology was on the march, remember these. In the early 1980s, the first personal computers appeared and means of transferring data developed. Who could remember that three and a half inch floppy disk? And of course, computing skills were being developed too. For local bird atlases, a breakthrough was the program that was developed for producing the maps for the Devon Atlas that was published in 1988. This group kindly shared their software with others, including the team that set about producing the first Barcher breeding bear atlas. So how did the Barcher atlas come about? In the mid-1980s, a number of counties were starting to plan local bird atlas projects. Ours actually started as a result of a conversation between Ian Collins, then our BTO rep, and Andy Swash at the BTO Radar Study Group Conference in 1986. 
So the conversation in the pub was probably later. But they both told me that this is where it started. So I'm sticking by that story. Early the following year, they convened a group, uh, a meeting of a group, which included Debbie Reynolds from NDOC, as they say, present tonight, Steve Abbott from East Parts, and, and myself. And within weeks, the project was up and running with the first year's field work that, uh, that spring. So that was really 1987. How did we do it? This is the credit of Tetra of gathering and collating the data. Again, it was a Tetra atlas. Participants were encouraged to adopt one or more tetrads and try and record all those species present that had either definitely bred, probably bred, or possibly bred, applying classification based on the evidence of breeding activity as used by the BTA as a national atlas. The results would then be entered on a card for each tetrad, like this. And then be sent in at the end of the season. These would be supplemented by casual records that anybody could spend on a piece of paper. This created a data entry task, and for three Christmases, Andy and Jill Swash undertook the considerable task of sitting in front of their personal computer and entering all this data up. One of the consequences was that it meant during the first two years we didn't know how good the coverage was until Andy and Jill had completed their task. However, in the third year, Tetras with little or no coverage were identified, and we, we organized hit squads for volunteers to go out and ensure that they were covered. The years following the first Archer Atlas saw a revolution in information technology. In 1990, Tim Berners Lee pulled together a number of recent in inventions to create the World Wide Web and the first website. The age of internet data transmission and collection was born. This would have just as much um, impact on the world of ornithology and local atlases and other corners as it would on the rest of the world. Here in Berkshire, Marek Walford, not here tonight, but thank you, Marek, set up his Bart's first website in 2000, enabling us to post and view sightings instantaneously. In 2004, the BTO set up Migration Watch to record sightings of arriving migrants that developed into bird track. The world of recording was transformed. And bird record archives had moved from a card index to a searchable computer database. So, in, when the BTO was, was, was planning its uh, bird national bird atlas project to run between 2007 <coughs> and 2012, it was set up so that online entry data would be the principal means of contributing. In a bold and generous move, the BTO also agreed to extend these facilities to anybody contemplating running local practices at the same time, as their database was set up to record at TechCab level. The new atlas would also be a combined breeding and winter atlas, so there was now the possibility of further local atlases appearing covering both seasons and to use quantitative data as well. Bartra BTO members participated in the pilot run in the winter of 2006 and 2007. Chris Robinson, our BTO rep, thought that as 20 years had passed since the field work for the first Bartra Apps project, it was time to repeat the exercise. And once again, a group was assembled, initially comprising Chris, Brenton Rigletto, present online this evening. Brian Clues, I think, is also present online this evening. Colin Wilson, here present. Jim Burnett from NDOC, who sounded not here tonight, from my good self. Now that we had the IT resources with DTO available, the decision was made. We would seek 100% coverage with time tech transfer visits in both seasons. In the event that while Andy and Jill had to manually process 22,989 records for the first atlas, the BTO processed 275,115 on our behalf. And as you'll see, that was just a small part of the enormous volume of, of, of records that they uh, processed for the National Atlas and about 40 other local atlases that they were running at the same time. We're all enormously indebted to the BTO to enable us to run such projects. And thanks to, thanks to this support from the BTO, we could produce winter and breeding distribution in abundance maps, and by combining the results of the first atlas 
And that's showing changes in breathing distribution too. So the next stage is to write up your book, to write up the species accounts, gather and produce the rest of the material for the book. So we sought volunteers to write species accounts and for the first atlas, produced a set of guidelines for them. For those old enough, cast your mind back to the world of 1990. Actually, I think you probably all are, but never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Most offices had word processing for document production. Different suppliers produced different products with no sorts of compatibility. Who remembers word star, word perfect, but it didn't matter as nobody was sending documents out electronically for others to amend. This meant that we faced the task of transcribing the draft accounts to edit them and put them together in the book. Soon after we started the task of writing up the book, we discovered that Peter Stanley, on the left there, county recorder for many years, was also working on a book to bring together the, the records in the then Reading Ornithological Club's possession and historic records to produce a, a work originally to mark the club's 40th anniversary. This was still work in progress at the time, but with the prospect of two competing works coming out in competition, the decision was taken to join forces to produce a combined avifauna and atlas. We weren't alone in doing this. A number of other counties who had undertaken atlas surveys at about the time we did at the first, the first one went on to produce the results in new, combined, new updated avifaunas, including this area, Buckinghamshire, Oxfordshire, Hampshire, Surrey, Sussex and Wiltshire. We also decided that we would like to illustrate every species. And of course, we were lucky enough to have Robert Gilmore, and he kindly agreed to act as art editor and to seek a line drawing of each species recorded in the county from artists, including all the previous winners of the pretty third bird illustrator of the year competition. And of course, being Robert, he filled many of the gaps himself. So the task of writing, editing, and collating began, and, and it took until 1995 to assemble all the text and illustrations ready to go to the publisher. Jumping ahead just a little, and I've lost the point on my screen here. What's on the screen? That's okay. This is the this is the publication team minus Andy, who was not available at the book launch in 19, at the end of 1996, and with Alistair Driver from the Environment Agency, who we will come to later, was a great help to getting the project actually done. When we came to writing up the second edition, we were able to take advantage of the lessons that we learned from combining the first edition and also the advances in technology. But about the time we were working on the first edition, a company called Microsoft was pushing its office software, which was becoming, over the course of the next few years, almost universal in the production of documents. And as the use of the internet grew, it became possible to pass text around a team check and edit easily without the need to transcribe it. Having in initially spent over seven years with being completing the field work for the first atlas and launching the completed book here, we decided to build on the work for the first edition by updating the text to incorporate the results of the second atlas survey and records for the intervening period. As a result, uh, well, this was because the first edition had actually been quite well received, so there seemed no need, need to reinvent the wheel. As a result, uh, we also, um, by the way, tightened up the managing and processing of the, of the, of the task. We issued just a few uh, accounts to volunteer authors or revisers so we could keep the good tabs on where they were. We recorded the date they were sent out, the date they were sent back, the date they were edited. So we kept a, a good control centrally over what was going on. And even though we had considerably more material, including a new where to what third section, we still managed to publish just over two and a quarter years after the field work was completed at the end of July 2011. So the next thing is funding. Originally, when planning just an atlas, we intended to publish privately. We hadn't given any thought how we're going to fund it, but never mind. When the project became a combined atlas and avatar, we initially approached outside specialist publisher to whom our manuscript was duly delivered early in 1995. After many months without any feedback, we received a response requesting a number of changes 
but as a group we were not prepared to accept. So we decided to take the project back in hand and publish ourselves. Now, if you're going to publish a book yourself without a publisher underwriting the cost, you need to raise the money to pay for it. What is surprising, by the way, is that the print and production costs didn't increase very much in the 17 years between the two editions, despite the great advances in what could be delivered. But in 1996, we only had a short period, because we were aiming to publish by Christmas that year, in which to raise the funds. We wrote to local businesses, the local authorities and others, and had a stroke of luck. The National Rivers Authority was about to be abolished, and they kindly gave us a grant comprising about a quarter of the cost before they were abolished. The day after they were abolished, the Environment Agency was established and had us to drive up in, in, in the corner there between Robert and Ian, we have, took up his new post at the Environment Agency and he had a new fund to award grants <laughs> and he gave us a second grant at another 25% <laughs> of the cost. So that really helps us through. We're very grateful to, to him and his organisations for doing that. That was the proceeds of a pre-publication offer and, a few, and the donations from others meant that we were able to break even within a relatively short period after, after the launch. The surplus that we eventually realised became the BOC Conservation Fund. Now, when we came to produce the second edition, we started fundraising during the field work. We were also fortunate in having the fundraising experience of Brian Clues, and he approached a number of trusts and institutions. We ran a sponsor of species campaign, promoted at the annual Royal County Parks Show in Newbury, and these, combined with the pre-publication offer, meant that publication was paid for before the book actually appeared. The result was that the Conservation Fund is now very well endowed indeed, over, I think, £30,000 in there now. So please do bring worthy projects to us to be funded from it. Design and production. When it came to design and production, when we took back control of the first edition, made in 1995, we needed somebody to design the final book and take it through the production process to deliver the printing bound volumes ready to sell. By good fortune, Andy Swass suggested we approach Rob Still. It's rather an old picture of him there in the, in, in the top there. A talented graphic designer whose principal business was then the design and production of commercial brochures. He and Andy had worked together on producing wild cards postcards and, and similar based on Andy's wonderful wildlife photos. With his help, the final production process began. And despite some setbacks, we concluded being let down by an external editor, which resulted in us having all night editing sessions at Andy's home. By the end of September, we had the text ready for publication by the end of the year. Rob's advice and design skills were invaluable. Back in 1996, we faced the choice of doubling the cost for full colour or producing a two colour book at very little extra cost to black and white. So, inevitably, two colour it would be. And there's a page from the first edition just under Rob's picture. Desktop publishing had found, sorry, start again. Uh, desktop publishing had transformed what could be put out, put designed, and produced. Any, and, and technology began to advance too. By the time we were looking for publication of the second edition, Rob and Andy were running their successful and acclaimed Wild Guides series of wildlife publications. Printing technology in the print industry had been transformed so that printing costs for full colour were little different than black and white printing. In 1996, we marveled at the prospect of Rob scanning copies of the line drawings in to design the book. By 2013, we could sit alongside him and watch the full colour pages as they were designed on screen before our eyes and electronic images be sent to the printers then in Poland for trial prints to be undertaken. The greater opportunities for design and illustration were taken by the group planning the second edition. Colin Wilson, here present, took on the, chart, the task of art director. He started commissioning line drawings before the field work on the atlas was completed and distributed the pictures by email for approval in batches. He also undertook the daunting task of going through the vast quality, quantity rather, of high quality digital cover images which were then available 
to decide which one would be used to populate the book. Technology has opened up many new ways of using and presenting the results. Renton's son Jason helped us on the IT side, setting up an interactive version of the Atlas results that appears on our website today. Back in 2015, when I was visiting Belarus, I was able to show the director of their BirdLife partner organization what could be done on my smartphone as we traveled around the country in the back of a car. The final output that came from the project was a result of a thought that occurred to me during a PCP BOC conservation committee meeting. It occurred to me that there was a group of adjacent counties that had all undertaken pet trans surveys at about the same time as the two atlases that we had run, the others being Oxfordshire, Buckinghamshire, and Hertfordshire. And from contact with those running them, I knew that all had aimed for 100% coverage. So we reached out to them. We were told that Bedfordshire, well, not aiming for 100% TD prime tetrad cover, but had, had aimed for 100% basic tetrad cover themselves. So the meetings were set up, and what emerged was the Thames and Chilton Bird Atlas, a page of which is here visible. Thanks to the design skills of Chris D from Hertfordshire, who'd also helped another a number of other local bird atlas groups put their results online, we now have results from this combined area showing changes at a tetrad le level over a substantial area of central southern England between the 1980s and the 2010s, or in the case of the two pioneer counties of Bedfordshire and Hertfordshire between the late 1960s and 2010. So, follow up, how have we used what we have produced and what we, have, what we use it for in the future? Here's just an example of the value of local atlases even in the world of online national atlases. On the left is the change map from the Thames and Chilterns Atlas for Woodcock at two kilometers, two kilometers square, tetra square, compared to the national change map. At a finer scale, you can see that the species has all but disappeared from a large part of central southern England, from the Chilterns, the woods of the Cotswolds, the Vale of Aylesbury, the Ouse Valley, and is now largely confined to the heath of south and southeast parts. So the black spots are the ones where it was still present between 2007 and 2011. The red downward facing triangles are all the tetras from which this has been lost. At a national scale, the scattered few remaining breeding records that you see, very few of them indeed in the other counties, are still sufficient to generate a proven breeding at 10 kilometer scale. So you'll see that the, the, the national decline map looks nothing like as dramatic as the local one. So where do we go next? In about five years time, we can expect another BTO Atlas survey to start. There are already some indications from local records and from the farm surveys that we, we are undertaking that there, be, there will be more changes. Perhaps, for example, the loss of meditated or lapwing as regular breeding species. And possibly on the, at the other end, part of breeding by one or two further egret species. Who will be able to carry out a third part for Atlas? Is there anybody out there willing to take up the challenge? And how will it be published? What this story shows is that technology, as well as hard work for many individuals, has enabled the group to produce high quality, well organised output from the results of our field observation. It has many uses. They contribute to national monitoring, provide accessible local data to inform decision taking, and the means of raising funds for conservation, and something that is also good to have and use, and rewarding to help put together. <coughs> it's not all plain sailing. In the period since the publication of our second atlas has sometimes been frustrating the process of using the results to inform, for example, review of local designated sites has sometimes been frustratingly slow. And I myself am disappointed that the um, governing body of the ecologist profession, the CIWM, its guidance on ecological impact assessment, makes no mention at all of referring to the growing body of large-scale local wildlife atlases, not just for birds, but for butterflies, orchids, dragonflies that are now available. Notwithstanding this, if you've never been involved in the process of producing a book, you will not appreciate the satisfaction that you get 
when it finally appears. So hopefully this will inspire some of you, I hope to volunteer, if and when the call goes out for the next one. So thank you for listening and for watching. I'd like to finish with a thank you to, to all involved, far too many to list, and also to apologise for any that are not listed there. Thank you very much. Well, thanks very much, Neil. That's a very good account of all the, the work that goes into to these atlases. It's, it's incredible to, to think that it involves so much expertise uh, and thought and planning. So, thank you. Does anyone, does anyone have a question for Neil? There was, there was a picture there with a the young guy standing at the back on the way. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> I just wondered who that was. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what working on an atlas has for you. Know. <laughs> it's only taken last year, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I think we'll we'll do the uh, change over the technology, so we're ready for our next talk. So our next speaker is going to be Brenton Metcalf. He's um, been our uh, chairman and president for many years, and. He keeps us on our toes in the committee. Um, he's also been a very um, active driving force for conservation activities in, in the county. Um, but not just the county, worldwide, but as being a, um, one of the, the senior members of the World Land Trust. So I'm going to hand over now to Renton, who's going to talk to you now on Berkshire's Birdscapes. 1947 to 19, well, no, 2022. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you, Robert, thank you. Um, first of all, I'm really sorry I can't be there in person, um, but as some of you know, I'm confined to barracks for the time being. Um, and Neil, thank you very much. That was a great, a great story, great introduction. Um, and it's really on the data that you have been talking about that, that my talk entirely depends. So thank you. What I thought I'd do for our 75th anniversary is look at the way that Berkshire's landscapes have changed over the last um, 75 years uh, and what's happened to our breeding birds over that period. This is a, uh, as you can all see, this is a red batch right. Um, one of my favourite birds. It's one that is no more as far as we're concerned. The red back shrikes um, are an icon of what we've lost. They were common in the 19th century, so much so that Clark Kennedy reports that boys of Eton school would collect their eggs and sell them by the dozen to collectors. It's a bird that was in slow decline through much of the 19th century uh, and the first half of uh, the 20th, but there were still plenty around in the 1950s. I used to see them on my way to school, walking across Mitcham Common, uh, where they were breeding on a, an old anti-aircraft emplacement. The last ones bred in Berkshire in uh, Shinfield in 1957. Interestingly, the, this decline is something which is peculiar to the Atlantic edge of, uh, of Europe. Um, in Central Europe, if indeed across much of Europe, it's a, still a pretty common species. If, uh, some six years ago, I was in the Evros Delta in spring and happened on a fall of shrikes. There were four species of shrikes, but amongst them, there were thousands and thousands of red back shrikes. A, remar a remarkably common bird, it seemed. 
Anyway, they're here no more, and that icon of loss is something that I thought I would be repeating time and time again in this talk, but I was completely wrong. Um, and I hope I'm going to show you why. The story is nothing like as bad as that. Here's a satellite view of Berkshire, um, 2021, Google, uh, with the current boundary. And it's the current boundary that uh, I will use for the whole of this talk, in including what was around 75 years ago, um, when the boundary, I'm sure, Neil, you'll tell me, was totally different. And the map here, let me see if I can get a pointer going. Yeah, okay, the gray areas are the built up areas. There you see Slough, um, Reading here, Newbury down here, Bracknell. The, uh, the green areas are woodland, the dark green areas are woodland, and the paler green areas are essentially predominantly arable land. Um, here's a a closer up view, you can see the fields. This is what most of Berkshire looks like. It's a pretty green county. Apart from the, you know, the, the, the East End, uh, most of Berkshire is countryside. So I wanna look at the main habitat changes that there have been over the last 75 years. And to do that, I've, I've divided the period into, into three periods. Um, firstly, the, the early part, 1940s, 50s, uh, a post-war reconstruction period. It led to big changes in agriculture and in the built, in, built environment. In agriculture, the arable area was extended at the expense of pasture and woodland to increase cereal production initially predominantly barley and then, on, then wheat. Large areas the east of the county were developed for housing and industrial uses. And large areas of the river valleys, in the, particularly in the middle and the east of the county, were excavated to provide the sand and gravel for buildings and roads. The second period that uh, I think we can identify as being seminal in what's happened to our birds is the area of industrial intensification, agricultural intensification. Um, much mixed farming disappeared, farms aggregated in, into larger holdings, there were huge increases in productivity uh, at the cost of course of much of our biodiversity. Hedgerows were lost to make fields larger, machinery became larger and larger. Herbicides and pesticides created essentially semi-sterile monocultures of the main crops. Autumn sowing changed the winter landscape and food availability for many birds. And new crops like Aussie grape appeared. This period of the 60s to 80s was also a period of rapid growth in the built environment, especially in the east of Berkshire. Uh, Queen Mother Reservoir was completed in 1976. It's one of the largest water, open water bodies in south, southern England. It's a great birding spot in the migration seasons, but it, it won't focus, it won't feature in, in what I'm talking about. There's few, few birds breed there, although now uh, peregrines do nest there from time to time. My last period, I will confidently call the green shoots of environmentalism. Um, in agriculture, aggressive intensification has been tempered by a greater awareness of the environmental damage of the preceding decades. We, we're using less damaging agrochemicals for the most part. Uh, there's a lot of targeted schemes to recover biodiversity and set land aside for nature. There's been a huge growth in voluntary conservation organisations and 
voluntary conservation activities. Um, and that has had a big impact, as we'll see, on some of, of, of our birdscapes, some of the birdscapes that I'm going to talk about. Lastly, in this period, we've got the effects of global warming, um, a warming climate. They're beginning to be seen on birds. Um, I'm not going to talk much about that, but I will be talking about our response to global warming later on. OK, so we'll look at the, the impacts of those periods on our main habitats uh, and the birds involved with them. This is a essentially a um, topic. It's a topographical mass map based on superficial geology. Uh, it shows the main um, habitat classes that we, we, we have in Berkshire. But we can conveniently um, classify Berkshire into. There's the, the chalk downland to the northern side here. A um, little bit of short downland too, of course, down in the south Walbury, Walbury Hill. More acid soils, um, the, the woodlands and the heaths of uh, central Berkshire, Bucklebury here, um, Greenham down here, uh, and Swinley Forest and Great Windsor Park around here. And thirdly, the third main habitat class I'm going to look at is the wet river valleys. Kennet, Loddon, uh, and the, the, the Thames. Oops. Okay, we'll start off um, with the out downlands. This is uh, the Lambourne Downs here. Much of the open downland had been enclosed in the uh, 19th century or even earlier. Um, most of that remaining after World War II was enclosed pretty, pretty well immediately after World War II and uh, turned over to arable farming. The remaining rough grassland and scrub is often really only to be found on slopes that are too steep for arable farming, like, like we have at Walbury Hill. There's been extensive reorganization of fields into much larger units, often without hedgerow boundaries. Uh, most of the ancient woodland, the residual ancient, ancient woodland, uh, was, was cleared, um, uh, much of it replaced by coniferous woodland. Then uh, later, I guess in the 60s, 70s, 80s, um, a number of farmers took up various woodland grant schemes and planted rather odd shaped and, uh, bits of woodland across the downs, which uh, I have to say sometimes I think rather scar the downs. The Downs as they are now are by far the most intensively farmed part of the county. Much of the area is still a bit of a semi-sterile monoculture of cereals or oilseed rape. Um, fortunately, in the last 20-30 years, many farmers have adopted countryside stewardship op options, such as here wild, wild, wildflower margins. Uh, plots for skylarks, lapwing, stone curlew, and so on. Not all have, but with Brexit and Michael Gove's promises and the principle of public money, public goods being applied to farm support payments, pretty well all, all farmers are having to get to grips with the various um, environmental land management schemes and now the, the new farming and protective landscape scheme, which will, applies very much in the west of the county. I have to say, I find it quite encouraging that many of the farmers and landowners that I meet and talk to are actually adopting conservation measures because they enjoy doing it and not necessarily because 
they get paid for it. They sometimes do this off their own bat. Sadly, not all the farmers are quite so enlightened. This is not actually the Downs, it's Cold Harbour, uh, where, where there's also a large area of intensive farming. It's sprayed within an inch of its life. There's not a weed in sight. When I started doing BBS, uh, breeding bird surveys there 15 years ago, yellow hammers were plentiful, corn buntings bred in good numbers. There were yellow wagtail and reed bunting um, breeding there. Now, apart from a few yellow hammers, they're all gone. This photo is actually a photo of the last yellow wagtail I found in, on territory there. Um, and I challenge you to find it in that field of oil sea grape. <laughs> okay, so uh, because it's so important to us, I'm going to look in a bit more detail at, about some of the, uh, some of the farmland specialist uh, bird species. The, the, this obviously just shows Skylark and the top graph shows the national index of relative abundance. This is taken from breeding bird surveys um, from, and the common bird census uh, from, from uh, 1966, I think it starts. What you see is a fairly typical graph of this rapid decline in the 60s, 70s, 80s which has fallen off. The decline is very much slower now, and that's a common feature of most of the graphs I'll show you. The, the graph below is the Berkshire only data from the breeding bird survey, um, which is only for the period, the last 25 years. But it shows you that over that period, Skylark has been pretty well stable in population. It's not going up, it's not going back to where it was, but at least it's stable. Similar pattern for Linnet. Similar pattern for Yellowhammer, although it looks as if the, the rapid decline occurred a bit later for Yellowhammer. Um, and it looks as if it may still be going down in Berkshire. There's still a suggestion of a slow decline. Corn bunting, similar story. Sadly, there are too few corn bunting recorded on our breeding bird surveys in Berkshire to calculate a, a local index, but the pattern seems broadly similar to the other resident open farmland species. For all of them, it's been a similar pattern, rapid decline in the period of agricultural intensification, apparently stabilizing over the last couple of decades. For two species though, it's, it is too late, too late in Berkshire. The last tree sparrows bred in Berkshire in 1996. Uh, this is a species that although it breed, it bred mostly in the river valleys and woodland edges, um, their demise is probably not due to failure in breeding, but to overwinter survival. They relied on cereal stubbles for winter feeding. Um, I read a, an NDOC report from 1961 that Leslie Stave sent me recently, um, which tells of a flock of over 300 on the downs at Compton. Um, now we have fewer than one record per year. The loss of stubbles um, and the conversion to autumn sowing may have been the major factor in their decline. There have been some successful recovery projects in, I'll go back, um, it, in Oxfordshire, but they've relied on there being a residual population. We don't have a residual population now in Berkshire, though the club is ready. We have a kit um, to get out and do winter feeding if a party were to be found um, and uh, we, we were able to get permission to set up winter feeding to encourage the, the group to stay. The other species that we've lost, of course, is the turtle dove. The bird relies on farmland weed seeds. 
their decline continued unabated into the last couple of decades. And now, as far as I know, there are no breeding pairs left in Berkshire. How much that's due to habitat change here and how much the losses on migration and in wintering habitat it is, is unclear. It's still very much a matter for research. Another migrant in trouble is the yellow wagtail. Up to the 1980s, most bred um, along the river valleys, as you'll see here, this uh, map shows the spot. So most of these orange squares, which are where there has been breeding has been seen to be probable or confirmed, are in the river valleys. Uh, there are a few on the downs. They bred there um, in, in using the wet meadows and other wet areas. They um, fed around the feet of grazing cattle. Grazing cattle numbers have fallen by more than half in the last 30 years. And if we look at what's happened between the 1987 atlas and the 2008 breeding atlas, virtually now the only yellow eggtails we have are breeding up on the downs. A major shift in um, the breeding habitat of the species. Like many other Trans-Sahara migrants, their numbers have fallen markedly since the, the 80s and 90s, but um, may have stabilised. Now here's uh, perhaps the most iconic downs bird for most bird watchers, stone curlew. Prior to World War II, it was fairly widespread where there was closely grazed open grassland. The post-war conversion of pastures to arable farming, which I referred to, has reduced their numbers and reduced their numbers to a handful of pairs by the 1980s. In 1991, uh, conservation work started. The RSPB started its re recovery project with a number of farmers, uh, which involved creating those bare areas which you see, the sun curly pots that you see. Now, though it's still scarce, it has resulted in a doubling or trebling of numbers. Um, and on an evening walk in the ridge, on the Ridgeway, in the Ilsley Compton area, you will usually hear their evocative calls. And if you're lucky, you'll see one or two. So this has been a, a fairly successful um, recovery story. While you're up on the downs, you may also hear summer in curlews. It's a relatively new, new phenomenon, um, only recorded since the late 80s. A few pairs breed along the Berkshire-Oxfordshire border uh, and one or two other down sites, but their, their hold is tenuous. Um, given the serious national decline that we're seeing, let's hope that uh, conservation programs could, can be put in place to uh, protect their breeding habitat. They, uh, it's lost due to predation of nests, which seems to be the big problem. So in summary, the downs carry many species of conservation concern. After some dramatic falls, most seem now to be stable, but we've got a long way to go to get back to the numbers in the uh, 1950s, 1960s. Okay, I'll move on now to a, uh, a different habitat. These are the slightly more acid soils shown in brown in this picture, uh, where you'll find the well-known heathland sites like Bucklebury Common, Snellsmore Common, Green and Common, Swinley Forest, um, together with the majority of Berkshire's woodland. Uh, from the, yeah, I think you can see it here. 
as well as the, the important areas of open heath, these areas are much more wooded than the rest of the county. The, the, the wood is, is, is the dark green areas. Um, historically, it was largely broadleaf woodland with lots of small, interspersed with small fields and settlements. Um, the, the commons were maintained as open heathland by grazing. Since World War II, fields have been enlarged. New road systems, housing developments have resulted in losses of the woodland and, and heathland habitat. Although the de development pressure is still high in the later part of our period, much of the land has been given various levels of protection. Uh, and wildlife trusts of, uh, and other conservation groups are helping to create more open heathland and more broadleaf woodland. But a large part of our woodland has been converted, um, both pre but much post-war, into coniferous woodland. Um, within which you'll, you'll see occasional patches of the ancient woodland species, ancient broadleaf woodland species. And there are some bigger areas of ancient broadleaf woodland. Uh, this is an area near Kintbury, there's um, coon woods in, in, in the southwest of the county. With reduction in grazing on the commons, typically they, these have now become more vegetated with gorse, bracken, bramble. Um, though conservation interventions by Bee Belt and others are recovering the short turf and heather at some sites. What's happening to the birds? Um, here's a couple that we're very, very concerned about. Perhaps only partly due to habitat loss, several of our specialist broadleaf woodland species are almost extinct now in Berkshire. Um, the willow tit, restricted to a few sites in the southwest. It's retrenched really quite rapidly westwards. Lesser body woodpecker, restricted to, to a few sites, mostly in the river valleys now, where they seem to favour decaying alder. Wood warbler, lovely picture by Gordon Langsbury here. Wood warbler now extinct as a breeding species in Berkshire. On the other hand, the expansion of coniferous woodland since World War II has given more opportunities for some species. You know, Siskin, Lesser Redpole and Crossbill all now breed regularly in the county. Whereas in 1947, um, I'm not sure that any of them bred. And here's an interesting assemblage of um, heathland and woodland specialist birds uh, that you might see in, say, Swinley Forest on a, a good summer's day. Only the top three here would you have seen in 1947. Night jars, breed and semi-open habitat. Um, They are reported to have declined substantially in the 60s and eight, the 70s, 80s, perhaps due to changes in forest management. Um, but since then, their numbers from the Atlas work, um, their numbers seem to be more or less stable. In the early part of the 20th century, red starts were fairly widely distributed in, in the breeding season in both broadleaf and coniferous woodland. Nationally, there's been a bit of a retrenchment to the uplands of the north and west of England. Now in Berkshire, they're largely restricted to the coniferous forest in the southeast of the county. Though I, I cannot see why they're not breeding in some of the broadleaf woodland, uh, the old, older broadleaf woodland that we have. Tree pipits are a much sadder story, once common on heathlands and in cleared forest. There are now very few pairs breeding in the county. Their population nationally has fallen 
um, some 90% in the last uh, 40, 50 years, since the 70s. Quite possibly uh, due more to changes in their wintering areas south of the Sahara than what is happening here. Okay, those top three were all migrant species. Below there are three resident species which are benefiting from the warming climate. None of them would you have seen in 1947. Firecrests were first found to be breeding uh, in the coniferous woodlands of East Berkshire in 1974. Uh, that, that those woodlands actually became a significant national stronghold for firecrest. They continued to spread and now you might find a singing bird in really quite small patches of conifers almost anywhere in the county. Dartford warblers first bred here 30 years ago. Um, they've increased in abundance and can be found at a lot of heathland sites now. Stone chats first recorded to have bred in 1946. Uh, but it really wasn't until the 1970s that they became established as a breeding species in, in, in Berkshire. Although a few breed on farmland, the, the great majority do so on our open heaths. The last habitat class I'm going to look at is the valleys of the Kennet and Loddon and the Thames. The floodplain meadows, wet meadows of the Kennet, Loddon and Blackwater were largely drained and improved for pasture before um, the last the, the World War II, um, some of them many, many centuries ago. By 1947, those that remained were mostly to the west of Newbury, um, but drainage has, has continued. So now really only quite small fragments remain. To the east in the river valley, valleys, uh, drainage was essentially <laughs> complete by the 1950s, though extensive gravel working did provide alternative breeding habitat for some birds. So what's lost and what's gained? Well, snipe lost now. They had been a common breeder on the wet meadows at the beginning of the 20th century. They were still breeding in small numbers into the 1960s, but now they're only a winter visitor. Red shank bred on the meadows to the west of Newbury in several places in the 1950s and 60s. Um, now there aren't any there. They, they do breed on some of the uh, gravel pits to the, in, in the central and the eastern part of the county. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, yellow wagtails no longer breed in the wet meadows. A few breed in small numbers in gravel workings. Um, but now, as we've seen, they're, they're largely a bird of the downs. <laughs> Further east, where the drain meadows have been replaced by gravel workings, things are very different. After extraction, some workings were used for landfill sites and became species poor grassland, essentially fodder for our geese flocks. Um, but quite a lot of restoration has been done and it's created wetland nature, is a, nature reserves. This is a photo of, 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 of Lee Farm uh, on which we were doing some restoration work uh, a couple of years ago. And this has really been an ornithological success story if you look along the Lower Kennet, Lower Loddon, Blackwater, Thames, there's a string of nature reserves, most restored as wetlands post-1980. Um, most of them are, are, are gravel pits. There's, in addition, you've got Dorney Wetlands. Um, we have Raysbury Triple SI and the Horton gravel pits from the Far East. So 
an extensive string and, and, and string which is being increased. There are new new reserves being set up. I say all the time, um, qu quite frequently new reserves are being established by local conservation groups and by local authorities. And here's a few of the breeding species that we now can enjoy around our gravel pits and wetland reserves, all of which are newcomers since 1947. Littering plover is a relative newcomer to the UK. First bred in Berkshire actually in 1947. By the late 90s, it was breeding in 20 or 30 tet tetras along the Kennet, Loddon and Thames, um, black-headed gulls, first confirmed to have bred in 1949, clearly benefited from restoration of gravel workings and the prov provision of nesting islands. Um, similarly, common terns. I've had taken the uh, liberty of being including a photo here of uh, Mediterranean gulls, uh, not yet confirmed to have bred, but they're increasingly seen with black-headed gulls in the summer um, and have taken up territory at one or two sites. And I've no doubt that in the next 25 years, they'll be breeding here too. Little egrets first bred in around 1991, I think. Um, I've taken the liberty of including a great white egret there. Um, that's probably another one, which in the next 25 years we'll see breeding in the county. Oyster catchers um, started breeding uh, 10 years or so ago. Cormorants, um, first bred in 1996 at Aldermaston. And now there's quite a lot breeding around the county. Although the first UK record of a singing Chetty's warbler was at Thatcher Marsh in 1971, the explosive colonisation of our river, river valleys um, actually began in the 1990s. Um, this is again a function like with stone chat and uh, firecrest and Darford warbler, it must be a function of the warming climate, the fact that we're having very few um, winters with long periods of, of, of snow and ice. So our wetland areas have been really quite a success. A lot of new breeding species and actually rather few lost. Much of this has been driven by conservation efforts of voluntary organisations like the Bells Wetland Trust, the Seal Area Bird Conservation Group, More Green, NDOC, BOC, but also um, one has to recognise that some excellent work by some of our local authorities and the contributions made by the Environment Agency and companies like Thames Water. Uh, the photo here is a team from Reading Borough Council, Environment Agency and Thames Water at Fobney Island a few years ago planting reeds in their spare time. Okay, um, time for some conclusions. In this survey that I've done run through on specific habitats, I've had to miss out a lot. For example, I haven't talked about the explosion of raptors, um, uh, which has, has, has been remarkable. And, uh, I haven't talked about the colonisation of our river valleys by uh, geese in the um, 50s, 60s, 70s. But the final tally I'm going to show now includes all the species that bred regularly in and around 1947. And those that are breeding regularly now. I'm ignoring sporadic breeders like Gargan and Pie Flycatcher that only you know, 
maybe here one year, but not the next. So we're, we're looking at the, the, the regular breeding species in the county. On Downland, or no, no, in total this is, we've lost 10 species since 1947. Okay, the coverage in 1947 was undoubtedly less than it is now, and uh, some species may have been missed, but it's probably fairly close to the position. We've lost snipe, turtle dove, wrynec, windchap, wheat ear, wood warbler, redback shrike, tree sparrow, hawfinch, soul bunting. We've gained um, 30 or so. Many of them, most of them, wetland species actually, uh, and some of them resident species which have benefited from global warming, from a warming climate. So we, the balance here is 10 species lost, 31 gained. That's the overall picture, but it hides some big differences between habitats. Almost all of the increase in diversity is in the river valleys, most of it associated with the wetland reserves. Few species have been lost, but many have been gained. I'm going to flag here the nightingale, which is has, although uh, we, we, we have or had a nationally important population in the seal area, its numbers are quite small. It's the, the habit, habitat is changing and maybe becoming less suitable for them. And that's a species that I think we need to be looking at and looking at what conservation measures might be taken to uh, protect it. But otherwise, our wetlands have been doing brilliantly. On the downs, we've basically gained as many species as we've lost. Um, but it, again, I'm flagging a number that needs some, we need, where we're losing, the numbers are falling and we need to be looking at what can be done to protect them. Fortunately, there's a lot of conservation attention being given to the downs and farmland generally. Uh, and the decline in many farmland specialists, as I showed you, has pretty much stopped. I guess if, if, if the reintroduction in Devon blossoms, maybe we'll even see soil buntings re reintroduced here, which would be wonderful, wouldn't it? Uh, as I said earlier, the, 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 the principle of applying public money to public goods, requiring farmers to get to grips with uh, environmental land management is, uh, is, is, is important. We, we are seeing more and more uh, commitment by farmers to doing this. For some, some years now, um, led by Neil, the BOC has been doing bird surveys to help farmers understand what they've got and provide conservation advice. Um, Neil didn't do the advert, but uh, the demand for surveyors is increasing and uh, anybody who can help here, do please get in touch with Neil. And my last area is, 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 is the woodlands. And it's here perhaps that I have my greatest concern. Um, we're lost. We've lost turtle dove, wood warbler, red back shrike, ryanek, hawfinch. We're ve well on the way to losing lesser spotted woodpecker, tree pipit. Willow wolvers are declining. Willow tits have almost disappeared. Marsh tits are declining. Spotted flycatcher of red stars. There's a lot of declines going on in our woodland. Um, quite why, I'm not sure that we fully understand. I do believe it's something that the BOC should try to get to grips with. The other thing to note is that our woodland cover is going to change dramatically in the near future. We'll more and more be using land to sequester carbon, mitigate rising CO2 levels. 
How we do that is, is crucial. We can expect more woodland cover, but huge eucalyptus plantations, um, one or two of which have appeared in some parts of the country, will be a wildlife disaster. On the other hand, we could um, recreate perhaps some of the lost ancient broadleaf woodland. The England, England Woodland Grant Scheme has strong biodiversity incentives built into it. Perhaps the BOC should be offering woodland owners help with surveys and advice on bird conservation, as we do for farmers. So that brings me into my, an end to my review of our birdscapes. What are the future? What are we going to do as the BOC as it heads towards its 100th anniversary? Clearly there are threats to our avifauna that we have to address, but there's also opportunities as we've seen there our wetlands, and I hope we can, we will see and can make with our woodlands. I don't see the interest in the environment that's grown so in the last 30 years or so diminishing. And it seems to me that the, the BOC's role here is to help keep public interest up in conservation, keep up the pressure on local and national government, and build further our engagement with farmers and landowners to help and encourage real on the ground conservation. Right. Thank you very much. Um, sorry again that I can't be there, but I'm happy to answer questions. Well, thank you very much, Renton. You put uh, an awful lot of work into that, I can tell. And the way the talk started, I thought it was going, all going to be uh, doom and gloom, but I was surprised to see it ending it in a fairly positive way, throwing out a challenge to the club. As Frenton says, um, he'll answer some questions. We've got time for one or two. Any questions? Can I stop sharing? Yeah. <clears throat> Yes, Chris. Can I shout? Um, or you can repeat it. I'll repeat it. I thought, I mean, first of all, thanks to Renton for that extremely well put together talk and really thought provoking. Although the losses are in some ways slightly overwhelming, there's clearly huge potential in the <coughs> county, I think, for really exciting change, positive change. And it feels to me that we perhaps need to be a little bit bolder in pushing for it. And one of the friends would like to comment on that. Okay, um, Chris is, is saying um, the perhaps the, the club should be bolder in pushing for changes, such as, as you were suggesting in your talk, Renton. Yeah, absolutely. I, 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 I think we, sh we should. We can. We're a substantial club. We have a long, long record of, of uh, good, good science and data to offer people. Um, the sorts of things that uh, Neil has been doing with farm surveys um, can make a real impact with farmers. As I say, I would like to see that extended to woodland activities. I think that's going to be a very important feature in the future. Um, and I think, yeah, the, the club can do a lot there. It's not just in, in the direct conservation, but also in its um, making its voice heard with, with the local authorities, um, with the, some of the larger organisations like the um, Environment Agency, the Wildlife Trust. Um, the, the BOC, I think, is probably underplaying its card at the moment. 
we can push harder. Okay, thanks, Renton. Point taken. Any more questions? Okay, we'll move on to just one, one final item of the evening. Um, Not too dark. <laughs> <laughs> Hi everybody. I would like to say I'm really, really pleased to see so many people have come back this evening. And if it takes bringing cake to lure people back, <laughs> then I will do it every fortnight <laughs> until the end of the season. Really, it's so lovely to see some places that I haven't seen for a really long time. Um, I'm just going to say some words um, really about Robert Gilmore because, as um, has been said earlier, he isn't a very well man and um, he would have loved to have been here, I'm sure but um, I've been given some words just to read out. Um, so dare I say that our most eminent president is Robert Gilmore with respect to others obviously that we have had. Um, he was awarded an MBE for his contribution to art and ornithology some years ago. Um, I've got here when he was 12 years old, but I think Neil mentioned he was 13 years old after lobbying the new ROC, Reading Ornithological Club, um, who thought he was too young to join. He was allowed to join um, when he was apparently 12 or 13 years old in 1948. He produced the first cover for the club's report the next year and has produced every cover picture since, 70 years of them. From the Canada goose of 1949 to a nesting goshawk for 2018, which will be out later this year. Uh, Robert Gilmore sends his best wishes to the club and tells us how important it has been to him over the years. And we can only thank him for his generosity and work and work on behalf of not just this club, but British ornitho ornithology generally. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Sue. Will you save some cake for me? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes, let them eat cake now. <laughs> okay, it just, just remains for me to say thank you to everyone who's contributed to this evening, to our speakers, to Sally for her expertise with technology. Um, an awful lot of work has gone into preparing for it. And it's good to see you all in the audience tonight. So thank you. We're going to close the online part of the meeting and um, those in the lecture hall come down and have a look at the memorabilia and, and sample some cake. Thank you. Since the 75th anniversary meeting of the BOC, we have received a message from Robert Gilmore which I would like to read to you now. For anyone, individual or group, to reach 75 is well worth a get together and a raising of the glass. I don't know how many members can claim to remember the BOC at its start. I was then, of course, very young. In those early days, it was the usual practice for the secretary to keep a detailed record of each meeting, to read out these minutes at the following meeting and for them to be signed by the chairman as a correct record. Dr. Watson's minutes were often the highlight of the evening. When the club was started, there was no place for children in inverted commas, and it was a few years before I was allowed to become the first junior member. We were immensely fortunate that Duncan Wood and Eric Watson were among the club's original members, as both knew the world of ornithology and knew a rich choice of speakers for our meetings. I remember that Duncan saw me safely home after these early meetings, which finished very late for me. One memorable evening, the talk was given by James Fisher, and at the end of it, I approached the great man, clutching a book for his autograph. Surprised to see a small boy at such a late night meeting, and even more surprised to be asked to sign one of his books, I still have the book, of course. Many years later, the job of arranging meetings continued to fall to the secretary, a post I was to hold for several years. 
On one occasion, I invited fellow wildlife artist David Reed Henry as guest speaker. I was confident of an interesting evening, particularly as he was usually accompanied by his handsome African hawk eagle. David had perched the eagle on a wooden saw bench borrowed from the woodwork department and in turn this sat on the top of a large wooden map chest. Towards the end of the evening David thought it time to show off his eagle's abilities on the wing, just a short flight across the front of the audience. The eagle's hood was removed and the time came for the launch. As intended the eagle flew straight to its wood bench perch which skidded across the top of the chest. Startled at this unexpected event, the eagle turned and spotted that the door of the projection room at the top of the theatre hall was open. This provided the eagle with the only perch in sight. Yet again, however, his chosen perch was not stable, and again he was off on his travels around the biology lecture theatre. I grabbed a leg of a saw bench, which happily the eagle was prepared to try again. This time his perch felt secure. David grabbed him and held on to his jesses. The whole event took far less time than it has taken me to write about it, but certainly gave the audience a thrill as the great bird swooped twice low over their heads. This club has been an important and valued part of my life. I send it my very sincere good wishes for the 75th anniversary and may the BOC continue to grow and flourish for many successful years in the future.